Welcome back to another sparkling edition of Off Air, the brand new talk radio TV show uh, where we get very interesting and very important people to talk to us about what they're doing, what they're thinking, uh, what's likely to be happening out there uh, in the world of politics. I'm delighted to say today uh, we are joined by one of the top Conservative commentators. It's Darren Grimes, a man who's been through the mill once or twice, I think that would be fair to say, say and who has come out of it sparkling and shining uh, like a modern day hero. And he comes to us on a day uh, when one of his many foes uh, has been talking uh, on the BBC, no less. He is, of course, Jolian Morm, Jolian Moron, as I like to call him, uh, the QC who battered the fox to death on Boxing mm -hmm. Day, uh, and who was on Radio 4 Today programme this morning, bleating on about how terrible it was that he had been piled upon on social media, which I thought, coming from him, was a pretty rare thing to say. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Jolian has been a thorn in my side for a number of years yeah. now. But I mean, this is a man who likes to raise money from people who've got plenty of it and then waste it on failed court cases. Yeah. He did that. Uh, the, the Electoral Commission looked into my affairs during the referendum twice. Mm. He judicially reviewed their second decision and then they came after me a third time. They joined this quango, this supposedly non-biased state regulator, yeah. joined Jolian and his FBPE mob and decided to come after me for a third time right. and then find us their maximum fine. And all because of this QC who was so driven, yeah. absolutely hysterical because of our vote for Brexit, that he made it his life ambition and his raison d'etre. Um, it's totally, totally. But I was incensed when I saw yeah. on the Today programme yeah. the day. Well, I saw your tweet and I thought, I'm so pleased that you were coming in today because we can actually go through this. Exactly. And, and people should know uh, how ghastly this individual actually is because for him to now play the victim is quite senseless and nobody should be taken in. N uh, no, definitely not. And I mean, he compared himself to Caroline Flack. I know. You know, the, the, this idea that he was hounded in any way that Caroline Flack was mm. is completely for the birds. Yeah. This is a man that starts online piles on, on people, that starts campaigns to take people through the courts it's politics by another yeah. means, basically, Mike, yeah. right? This man is using other channels away from the ballot box to meet his political yeah. aims. I think that's really actually quite damaging for democracy. Mm. But the fact that the Today programme didn't give him any pushback whatsoever and call him up for his yeah. own hypocrisy, right. I couldn't believe well, what I, I was listening I find it extraordinary. To. I mean, the Today programme has fallen so far from where it used to be, when it used to be the must-listen-to breakfast show for anybody who was involved in politics, because they always had the best guests, they always had the best kind of um, analysis of what was going mm -hmm. on. Now, of course, we know the Cabinet won't go on there, because mm -hmm. Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, quite rightly, in my view, have said, you know, we don't have to talk to you, just because you think you're the flagship radio show in the world, you know, we're not going to talk to you because you're too biased. Well, exactly. And I mean, I couldn't recommend anyone strongly enough to listen to talk radio yeah. instead. Well, exactly. Uh, well, Julie Hartley Brewer, far more interesting in the morning than the BBC would ever be. And of course, uh, followed by me. Well, I can't recommend myself highly absolutely. enough. Absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, the thing about Julian Morm as well is that he absolutely represents this class of people, the FBPE crowd, mm -hmm. as you call them, um, who basically were this kind of superior, supercilious, you know, looking down on everybody else who voted for Brexit because they were too stupid to know what they were doing. And I mean, he is the ultimate kind of king of that lot, isn't he? Listen, I think you look, look no further than what he did, what he tweeted over that Christmas period when he tweeted about that fox. Yeah. It was dripping with arrogance. Yeah. It was dripping with egotism that says, I can get away mm. with this because of my position and who I am. Yeah. I'm a member of the Queen's Council. Yes. You know, your terrible crime was to have a view that differed from his mm -hmm. at the end of the day. That was all it was. And you wanted something different for your country than he did. It, and, and you were able to, to be very good at articulating that. It's that having the temerity to dare campaign for something that these metropolitan liberal mm. elites don't actually want to see happen. And that's, I mean, I've always said I'm motivated by one thing in politics and that's ensuring that people in communities like that where I come from in County Durham actually have a voice yeah. because I think in the world of media there are far too few people like you mm. and far too many people like Jolie. Yes, exactly right. I mean one of the pre problems we talk about a lot on this show and on, on many other shows that I do is that the media itself has become very elitist, you know, because there was a time 
when the media was made up of people like your parents, mm -hmm. you know, guys and women who would learn a trade, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't go to university, mm -hmm. they'd learn a trade which was journalism, they'd learn shorthand, they'd go to the local council meetings, they'd go to the local criminal courts and they'd report into the local paper and they might then get themselves into the BBC and then into, um, you know, national newspapers. But now it seems to be full of these kind of privately educated, mm -hmm. um, very Oxbridge mentality types who are all the same. And they, you know, and I'm not going to criticise Robert Pestered individually or Andrew Marr or anybody like that, but if you look at them all, they're all kind of cut from the same cloth. Exactly. That's 100% mm. correct. Uh, glowingly so. But, I mean, I was on Politics Live not too long ago, one of the BBC yeah. shows, and I came off and they said, why have you got him on? He doesn't have a degree. You know, no. this idea that you cannot really? comment on yeah. politics if you don't have a degree or mm. you're not some expert. Right. I mean, Jolian's a tax lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Why is I he hope he's better at tax law than he is at everything well, he else. He doesn't seem to be doing quite a lot in that well, uh, I mean, area. Well, he's he? also, I mean, he's one of the many lawyers that I've had tangles with on Twitter, right? He's blocked me now, by the way, but he's come at me a couple of times and accused me of libeling him, right? And I know a lot about libel. I used to work for a national newspaper, so we know the best libel lawyers uh -huh. in the business, right? And I would always go back and I would say, look, you're a lawyer. How can you accuse me of libeling you when you know perfectly which part of what I said libeled you? And then he just would disappear again and go scurrying back under well, his little chicken. You chair. know what that is? The only way, the only reason he's doing that is because he thinks that's the one way to shut you down. Yeah. That's the one way to yeah. make you think, oh, well, I mustn't engage this person mm. anymore or debate his ideas and what he says right. because I can put the fear and of I'm, God in it. Yeah, because I'm a lawyer. Exa I'm a QC. Yeah. I had a similar run in with the secret barrister, right, who accused me of libeling. I said, mate, you don't exist. You don't have a reputation because you aren't anybody. You know, if you want to come out and admit to who you are, mm -hmm. then I'll libel you. Mm -hmm. But right now, I can say whatever I like about you because mm -hmm. you are a fake account. Mm -hmm. And he and blocked me as well. Well, totally. I, but <laughs> I mean, do you know what? Actually, there is, bizarrely, there is one case coming up of Jolian's, which I potentially do support. Okay. And I'll tell you why. So he's t potentially taking the government to court over environmental policy. Oh, yes. I actually think that this could go some way in exposing the deceit of achieving net zero by 2050, mm. because I don't think the government and politicians in general are being honest with people about the trade-offs that will be required with yes. that. You know, that means you lose your heating, right. your car, your holidays, cheap food, right. so many ways in which they're, they're being fast and loose with the facts, yes. basically. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? I was very disappointed, actually, with Boris Johnson taking on this whole green agenda, because I was rather hoping that he wouldn't. I was rather hoping that, you know, he would be an old-fashioned conservative rather like most of the people in the Conservative Party who are not really interested in paying more taxes to stop climate change mm -hmm. and who are not really interested in this whole kind of, you know, campaigning behind, you know, Greta Thunberg and all of that. But it's interesting you mentioned that case because it's another crowdfunded scenario uh -huh. which Julian Warm has organised and he's got another crowdfunding source out there. And the last time I looked, they already had about 25,000 quid. The thing I find amazing is where they find the idiots to give them the money. As far as going back to government policy is concerned, though, Julian could be a useful idiot in yeah. this in this this dispute because he could actually raise attention to the fact that government just doesn't have any yeah. plan in action right. to actually achieve net zero by 2050 because they know how damaging or potentially don't know, right. and that's even scarier, and also, how damaging it will what's be. What's it got to do with Jolien Moore? Why has he suddenly that's now true. decided to get involved in green issues? Because one of the things he did say over that sort of mad Christmas period, Boxing Day period, was that when he realised he'd made a massive blunder by doing it the way that he'd done it and, and boasting about it and having little jokes with his lawyer mates about killing a fox. He then started talking about how he wanted to possibly operate in this space, were his words, you know, uh, in the mean, uh, in terms of like animal husbandry and how, how animals were looked after, which was clearly just a, a ruse to try and get everybody off, the, off his case. Mm -hmm. well, and so know, now he's gone green. I, well, I think the going green thing is a really clever tactical decision, actually, because if you think about the zealots in the FBPE, the Continuity Remain campaign right. movement, yeah. they're all massive environmentalists and greenies. Yes, they all That's are. That's the aren't they? next religion. Yeah. The, it's not the EU anymore. Mm. It's it's this green crap basically yeah, right. that they're all pursuing. I mean, what incense? What makes me really angry is that recently Bloomberg uh, published some stats that showed that the pri the wholesale price of energy has dropped by something like thirty percent. Mm. But bills haven't. No. Right? You've got households, the least well off in society, penalised the most. 
by green taxes and by this pursuit of net zero, yeah. they're going to have to do a lot of upgrades to the infrastructure right. and that's being put through those costs of that are being passed on to the least well off in society mm. that's what these yeah. green policies well, I mean, are doing one of the things that came up because they've sort of hinted at without going quite as far as to say it's definitely conservative party policy they've hinted at ripping out everybody's gas exactly. boiler right Hydrogen. now somebody said to me who was actually a gas engineer he said well what are they going to do with all the people who are gas engineers are mm -hmm. they going to make them all unemployed are they mm -hmm. going to retrain them to do something else mm -hmm. and what about people who live in very rural parts of this country who are not lords of the manor mm -hmm. but who are just ordinary folk who mm -hmm. live in a little farmer's workman's cottage and they need to have probably either gas cylinders or they've got an oil heater or they've got oil being delivered into a, into a tank in the back garden. What are they going to do with all those people? Well, even thinking about coal, right? Mm. We have got rid of that almost, and we certainly are from 2024, from the energy mix, from electricity. Mm. But we still need it for things like cement yeah. and steel. Right. And if you think about how many infrastructure projects that Boris Johnson is promising every yeah. other week, he's got right. a new infrastructure project. We need that coal. The Extinction Rebellion tried to shut down work in County Durham on an open cast coal site, right. which, by the way, once they're finished with it, they do up the area and right. it looks beautiful right. afterwards. But where I hope it wasn't those topless women, was it? No, it wasn't. Oh, my similar, God. Similar I, was, I was quite traumatised about well, that over the weekend. Well, me too. Um, <laughs> but they're import, we're importing millions of tonnes of coal from Russia. Mm. Do you reckon their environmental standards oh. are hunky-dory? Well, Absolutely I not. mean, I thought the whole point of us becoming sort of self-sufficient in energy was to stop the ability of the Russians to hold us to ransom exactly. over supplying our exactly. energy through that big gas pipeline for a start that mm -hmm. comes into Western Europe. So if we buy coal from them, uh -huh. it doesn't sound like a very good no, idea. No, definitely not. And we're still ne we might not need it for electricity but we still need it yeah. to build to create steel and build the right. infrastructure that we need so these I think what is really important for me right is that you actually look at the consequences of these people's actions it's all well and good a virtue to the green crowd mm. but when you start to hurt the poorest people in society right. that's when I start to yes. get upset well funnily enough I had a conversation with with one of the very few sensible voices on the climate debate uh, who actually is a bit of a, a skeptic not so much about that's climate changing because I think I don't think there's anybody out there who is technically a climate change no. denier you know we know that there are floods we know that there are sort of incidents of of extreme weather which perhaps we haven't seen for a while however um, not everybody believes that that one we are to blame or that two we can change that right mm -hmm. but he was saying that all of the things that can be done easily have now been done mm -hmm. by this government mm -hmm. and by other governments and now it starts to get tough because now is the time then they have to start hurting people mm -hmm. in order to get to exactly. the targets that they want. So you're absolutely right in saying that because already we're seeing electricity prices, as you say, going up because of green taxes. We already pay more money to fly Despite than anybody the cost else. Of it going down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, look at what happened over the past weekend. You know, the price of oil has gone down to thirty dollars mm -hmm. a barrel, mm -hmm. which is a drop by a third, I think, approximately. We're not going to see cheaper petrol at the petrol Definitely station, not. are we? And the fact is, most of what we pay at the petrol station is tax. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Well, it is. It totally is. And I mean, it's just let's be honest. And I think that's why people like you are so fantastic because you do hold politicians and. and and these campaigners to account and ask them how they're going to pay for these mm. policies because it strikes me that actually all they want to do is get rid of all the progress that yeah. we've made over the past 100 years. Yeah, they want us to go back to living in caves or De something. Well, definitely, yeah. I mean, even if you think about living standards, if I'd been born 100 years ago, my granddad was down a pit, yeah. right? They wouldn't mind seeing those sorts of living standards brought back about again. Yeah. And I just find it... Well, amazing. it's like all the people that campaigned against the closing of the mines. It's like, you know, I don't want to send my children down a mine. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to send your kids down mm -hmm. a mine. Why would you? Mm -hmm. It's a horrible way to have totally, to make a living. Totally. And the people who actually did do it for a living had miserable old age because they suffered from a vibrating finger or they suffered from well, you know cold, cold lung they couldn't they got cancer you know I mean we should be better than that and we are better than that mm -hmm. but I think this is part of the problem Darren as well that you know you've come from a very working class background so you're immediately kind of looked down upon by yeah. some of these middle class uh -huh. types who have never had to worry about anything in their lives I mean these extinction rebellion people right the ones who are genuinely kind of actually mentally disturbed by the fact that the climate is going to somehow kill the planet have literally got nothing to worry about. Because mm -hmm. if they did have something real to worry about, like putting clothes on their back or feeding their kids or making sure that they were well enough to go to work, 
they wouldn't be worried about all this nonsense. I mean, I was back home at the weekend and uh, I went around our local Asda and yeah. I, I noticed that there hadn't been any stockpiling done in Asda in Stanley and County Durham. Right. And that's simply because people don't have the cash, right? right. People don't have the extra cash right. to be able to stockpile toilet roll. No. Um, so this, this madness, in my view, madness, hasn't happened up in areas like that. But that's because they haven't got the money in order to... Yeah to commit these acts of what I think are totally nuts. Yeah. But that's what people need to recognise, is that these policies have consequences, mm. and the consequences could mean that people in the northeast of England lose their high-skill, high-wage jobs in areas like that open cast coal site, yeah. for example, and that's food on families' tables. Yes. Gone, gone Because totally. this government, I think, is beginning to show some slightly worrying signs. And I don't know whether you can tell me how it's being received up in uh, the North East where, where all of those people voted Tory and have said very clearly, we're only lending you our votes for a bit. Let's see how it goes. I'm slightly worried that Boris Johnson's government is all about, um, you know, smoke and mirrors and it's all about spending all this money. They suddenly found 46 million mm -hmm. um, to find a, vi a, vi a cure for the coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to give that money away. They're going to spend a billion quid, supposedly, uh, putting up a few more 5G masks between now and 2025. And everything's all about massive amounts of money that we don't really have. No, definitely not, especially not when you look at public debt yeah. and the size of the tax burden. It's mm. at a 50-year high. Right. You know, we don't have all this cash to be splashing around. I do think that on sensible infrastructure projects like ensuring areas in the north are connected because yeah. that's the biggest block yes. on achieving employment in the north because mm. people just simply cannot access the areas that do have right. the jobs and the way in which you grow prosperity is to connect areas like that so what are we doing instead yeah we're spending a hundred billion quid on hs2 I know. Beggar's belief, which nobody wants, no. which nobody apart from the kind of transportation wonks think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I'll be dead by the time it's ready, right? Because it's going to be 2040 before you can actually get on the train. And can you imagine how much technology will have advanced exactly, by then? Exactly, exactly. Why, why the hell would you want to get on a train? Well, we You'd might be get driving drone. cars or something well, exactly. at that point. You know, exactly. it, it's, it's this, it's short-termist. Mm. Um, short term is 2040 is not exactly down just down the road around around the corner but it's it is this short term thinking this sort of oh well we we've got a mayoral election coming up in yeah. the west midlands so right. we can of cancel hs2 right. even though it's costing 100 billion quid and it's these sort of you just want them to take a step back yeah. and actually look at the consequences of the policies right. that they're putting forward right because i mean i like boris johnson i'm glad he's the I prime do. minister uh, i think he did a pretty good job as mayor of london but he hasn't got a great track record in kind of these big projects that he likes to do or that he wants to be famous for. Because the trouble with all these prime ministers is they are all massive narcissists and they want this kind of legacy to be left behind. I mean, you see what Tony Blair did when he thought it was a great idea to invade Iraq. And now that's his legacy and it's poisonous. And, mm -hmm. you know, nobody likes to see him anymore mm -hmm. as a result. Boris, I think, needs to be a bit careful that he's not just getting away with murder because nobody's actually telling him he can't. Well, I, I agree. But, I mean, being back home at the weekend, all my fam my uncle voted Tory for the first time in his life yeah. uh, last time. And he was saying, he was talking, all he wanted to talk about was the Pretty Patel saga. Yes. And he was saying that he reckons that she'll be the next female prime minister of this she country. She might be. And it's, it, it really hit home for me, yeah. actually, the massive disconnect between the media, political, civil service, class yeah. in this country and the ordinary voters on the ground mm. so i am absolutely delighted that boris johnson has been quite robust yes. in his defense yeah i was her. a bit worried actually coming up to prime minister's questions last wednesday because even though i absolutely think she's doing the right thing you know sometimes the noise and bluster exactly. around a story mm -hmm. means that you just say well do you know what we're just going to move her to the side uh -huh. it's easier when he sat when she was sitting next to him in prime minister's questions i thought that's great mm -hmm. and when he was so robust as you say about mm -hmm. defending her i thought well that means that he's not going to give in to the first wave but there will be more. But some of the accusations are so ludicrous. Yeah. And you just think, I don't know anyone in their right minds in journalism that would run those stories. Yeah. But yet they were being run. Totally. Like the woman who supposedly took an overdose. Turned out she'd only been working for it for two weeks and she'd taken an overdose the year before. Mm -hmm. So as sad as that story is, it's got nothing to do with Prissy Patel. Mm -hmm. Exactly, know? yeah. But it really does hit home for me 
that Twitter is not Britain. No. And that's what these politicians have got to remember. Mm. Every time there's one of these hyped up storms that the media is absolutely yeah. desperate, frothing at the mouth to create. Yes. That's why I didn't support Boris going to visit the areas that have been flooded. Right. You know, when people are trying to rebuild their homes, the last thing they want is a media circus right. turning up on their doorstep right. with the Prime Minister surrounded by the press pack. They just want the money, the resource, right. to one, be able to ensure that this doesn't happen again, but two, to be able to rebuild their lives. Yeah. And that's what these idiots on Twitter I must admit, understand. even though I should, as a journalist, be against it, I'm actually all for Dominic Cummings treating the press with such disdain. I think it's quite funny, mm -hmm. you know, because some of these people are so pompous and they're all like, you know, well, you have to talk to me. Even Andrew Neil, I was disappointed with Andrew Neil because I like him as well. When he came out and did that sort of one person piece to camera about why Boris Johnson wasn't coming on his show. You know, it's not like you have God, God's given right to demand that politicians do what you mm -hmm. want. You know, you're a, pol you're, you're a political journalist. That's it. If they choose not to come on, they don't come on. I mean, the BBC has 75% of the news market, mm. right? It's this, they feel like they've got a God-given right. Well, for the right. moment they do. I'm well, not sure they're going to have exactly, it forever. Exactly, exactly. It is dwindling. Mm. But when you've got all these people, e pro-EU types, talk about a level playing field. When you've got the BBC, which has 75% of the market, how is that a level playing mm. field? You know, they, you're forced to pay for it, yeah. and it's got a dominant share of the market. Any other industry, that would be broken up. Yeah. EU competition yeah. law and our own competition markets, regulatory Well, I would markets. love to see more speech radio in this country because in countries like Australia and America, speech radio is really vibrant. You know, some of it's absolutely bizarre. Some of it is, is, is nutty. Some of it's extreme, but it's fantastically healthy and people can choose what to listen to. In this country, you can't choose what you want to listen to uh -huh. because you're basically faced with about two choices in a lot of places. Yeah. And the BBC have made it impossible because, and I know this from personal experience, because I ran a speech station up in Edinburgh uh, for a while before it just lost its so much money it had to close down. Because you can't compete locally mm -hmm. with the BBC. BBC totally. Derby, BBC Sheffield, BBC Leeds, BBC Surrey, BBC Sussex. We don't need all that. No, definitely not, definitely not. And that's, I mean, it goes to the very heart of my um, complete lack of support yeah. for the licence fee. I mean, one, it's regressive, right? It hurts the poorest hardest. Two, if the poorest people in the country don't want to pay for it, it's single mothers mm. that are getting clobbered yeah. by this. They're being and they're getting prosecuted. Exactly. And some of them are going to jail 10 as a result. 10% of magistrate co yeah. court cases in 2016 or it's 2017. It's a shocking state of affairs. So how is your life now? Have you? Do you feel as if you've sort of become almost, I don't want to say come of age through this whole thing, but I mean, you were very young when this was all going on and you were getting absolutely bullied and pushed around and kicked about by the likes of Carol Cadwallader uh -huh. and others. I mean, another ghastly individual as far as I'm concerned. But how, how are you now sort of as an individual? I mean, I don't want to take out the world's tiniest violin because uh, <laughs> I've actually got it quite good now as far right. as things are concerned. Well, so you deserve it. But, well, I mean, if I look back though on life as far as... Um, you know, my mum went through a, quite a nasty divorce quite early on mm. and uh, I was helping her switch energy bills and things like that from quite an early age. So I've always had to be a bit more mature right. than maybe I should have been mm. at that age. But that a 22 year old going through that, that with the Electoral Commission, yeah. that was a real massive Because there must have been call. times when you thought, I'm going to go to prison here or something, or I'm going well, to be financially ruined, I'm I, never going to be able to recover. I don't think I've ever thought I'm going to prison, I mean touch wood, but I've always feared being bankrupt, definitely, because, yeah. I mean, the Electoral Commission during the court case, I don't know if this is an exclusive, I don't actually think I've said this before, but the Electoral Commission during the court case counter-offered. After the first day in court, they right. realised that this wasn't going right, well for right. them and that the judge just wasn't buying anything. That They had reversed the burden of proof, right? right. They had said I had to prove that I hadn't done it, right. when actually that's not how the no. law works, right? No. Um, so... That it hadn't gone well for them, and they said, "Right, we'll let we'll reduce the fine to five grand. It was twenty grand. That was the maximum mm. fine they could impose. We'll reduce that to five grand, and we'll say that we've uh, we've looked into it, and maybe things aren't as bad as they seem." I turn round to them and I says, "What world are you living in? Right. I haven't got five pence. Right. Never mind five grand. Right. You know, five grand would be enough to bankrupt us." Yeah. And there's nothing more dangerous in life than someone who's got now to lose. Right. So I said, no, I'm, 
I'm in it to win it. Right. You know? Absolutely. And thank God you were, because mm -hmm. in the end, that would have meant that you'd have to admit it to some kind exactly. of wrongdoing, exactly. which was entirely mm -hmm. incorrect. And then the judge completely quashed their notice, said they'd got it wrong in fact and law. And these are the so-called so guardians yeah. of our democracy. Yeah. Well, I mean, we saw that through the whole process of the Supreme Court and the prorogation, Definitely. which, of course, our good friend Mr. Maugham mm -hmm. was also involved in. He was up in Edinburgh mm -hmm. representing our friend Dale Vince again. You know, there's a pattern emerges here, right? But that ridiculous notion of um, Lady Hale going after that she'd made that decision, and I'm not impugning Lady Hale in any way, but to accuse the Prime Minister of breaking a law which didn't exist before he broke it Definitely. was quite bizarre. Yeah. And lawyers hate it when you argue with them, especially if you end up making a better argument. And that should never have ever gone to the Supreme Court. She should never have made that ruling, and she certainly should never have done that spider thing, you know, where she mm -hmm. wears this, and, and all these idiots on Twitter yeah, now with yeah, the little with spider. The Twitter, yeah. And you just go, oh, don't give up, mate. What are you, seven? You know, mm -hmm. it's really pathetic. But the lawyers of this country are to blame for an awful lot. I, I would say as well as too many of them in Parliament, far too many qualified lawyers in Parliament, and they're dangerous people because, like you say, they think they can use any argument to win um, a, a matter of, of law, and they don't care whether the electorate has voted for something. They think they can find some method and some means of stopping it. Well, if we think about the, all the ways in which they tried to stop Brexit, right, that wasn't through yeah. Parliament. Parliament was deadlocked. So they thought, right, here's our opportunity away from the ballot box. Mm. I think Brexit presents us a real opportunity to actually look in all these things again. Because in my opinion, being able to judicially review, to take things to the Supreme Court, to fight politics by any other means than the ballot box, that's why I think Suella Fernandez being put in mm. to, Suella Braverman now, sorry, uh, she got married, yes. as, as Attorney General. Yeah. That's a real sign, I think, that Dominic Cummins and the Prime Minister are really serious about reforming this because I really don't think that politics, politics politicians should be accountable, right? Yeah. They shouldn't be able to worm their way out of it by fighting it through courts mm. instead, which is what we saw during the Brexit process yeah. when they tried to thwart Brexit, Dominic Grieve and all yes. the rest. Well, that was why it was so glorious, wasn't it, watching election night. We've been doing a show live here from, uh, from this very studio. Um, as all of them just fell like nine pins, you know, and you just went, oh, Dominic Greaves out, oh, Philip Lee's gone, you know, um, that other guy, Sam Jima. All the um, Change UK yeah, lost, all, all gone. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible to watch. And in a way, I suppose, we have to be careful to not forget that, because actually, as much as these people like Jolene Moore still make a lot of noise, they're not actually, they don't actually count for anything. They don't really represent anyone. Um, they don't represent much of a movement anymore, because most of the FBPE crowd have disappeared now, presumably off to, you know, complain about something else. Like you say, join the eco-plankery. But, I mean, you know, Boris Johnson's in a really strong position, and I just want to see him doing some really good things. And, but, I mean, current, you're right, though, that they don't matter. They're inconsequential, especially with an 80-seat majority. Mm. But they do have a disproportionate amount of power. They yeah. can still fight Boris Johnson's decisions, like we're going to see on the environment stuff mm. you've seen it with Heathrow being cancelled yes. right they're able to fight these political what I think are political decisions mm. through our court system yeah well this new campaign that's, that Dale Vincent Moore are doing has in, 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 its, in its stated aims says it thanks the uh, the decision on Heathrow for the point of, of what they're now doing because exactly. they're saying look we've 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 seen that we can stop government policy it let's, might mean car the let's carry on to mind so there's well it's not all bad that's one of the things that confuses me the most because the green party apparently is against hs2 mm -hmm. and i'm going hang on a minute it's a train well, you're, you're supposed to be for that aren't you but apparently it's, it's upsetting too many wild you've got it all wrong man you've got it all wrong all they want is for what all to go back to living in caves that's what it that's is it. isn't it well all i want is to give caroline lucas 100 quid uh, so she can make me a cake, because that's what she's promised to do during the last election campaign, <laughs> well, there we are. when she was charging 150 quid to show people around Parliament, which apparently is illegal. <laughs> but listen, Darren, great to see you. Thank you very much for coming in, and um, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Darren Grimes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll see you next week with another edition of Off Air.